This is the Ted Walshin Podcast. Brought to you by Helenda's The Meat People. Enjoy their award-winning products at selected Metro, Sobeys, Fortino's, and Foodland locations. Helenda's, the way sausage should taste. And Tom's Place. For the finest in men's clothing at unbeatable prices, it's Tom's Place at 190 Baldwin in the heart of Kensington Market. Tom's Place will suit you. And now, here's Ted Wallachin. My special guest this week's career as an actor and director in television and film spans more than 50 years. He's appeared in such classic films as Invasion of the Body Snatchers, Face Off, Black Christmas, and Porkies. And on television, you would have seen him on Dallas, L.A. Law, Murder, She Wrote, and he picked up a Gemini Award for his work on the hit CTV show ENG. This year, he received the Award of Excellence from ACTRA. Currently, he can be seen in the television show Surreal Estate. Please welcome Art Hindle. Well, first of all, congratulations on your Award of Excellence from ACTRA that you received, I guess, this past spring. That was a, that's a, a nice touch. Well, that was, yeah, I was, uh, was quite uh, gobsmacked. Um, as I said in my acceptance speech, my very brief acceptance speech, I think I broke the record for shortest acceptance speech. But uh, <laughs> as I said in that, I said the only uh, excellence that's attached to me is, uh, is, our, is my family and my friends. That's, that's where the excellence comes in. Uh, well, there's a, I think there's a lot of excellence on the screen that, that we would just uh, over your career. In your career, you're now in your sixth decade. Is that right? Uh, who's counting? It's something like that. I think uh, I've been doing it for 54 years. Let's put it that way. Since 1968. Okay, 54 years. All right. Yeah. And wow. I, I think I've almost got, it, almost got it down now. <laughs> yeah, I'm not shy. that's the way I look at, like to look at my career, too. Bordering on professionalism. Just, just about there. You're, I didn't realize yeah. that you were, you were born in, in Halifax, Nova Scotia. Yeah, my dad was in the Navy. I lived there about, oh, five, maybe six um, months. <laughs> oh, Literally. <that's> <laughs> well, yeah, I don't know why my mom. Uh... I was going to say you got a lot of great memories, no doubt. <laughs> yes. Uh, most of them of the sky, because, mm-hmm. you know, the only photographs I have are, are me in a in a crib or no, a baby carriage or something in the backyard of the place we had there. And uh, I don't think my mom liked Halifax very much. They were both. Yeah, they were both from uh, Toronto, from the beaches area. So I think uh, as soon as she could, she uh, hightailed back to Toronto and, and waited for my dad to be. Uh, out of the Navy and back home. So what opened the door for you to enter the world of entertainment? Well, I'd, I'd actually gotten my license and became a stockbroker. I had a, a client list. I was doing really well. I, I, I could play the market really well. I had a professional account. For some reason, I could read the stock ticker and see where buying was coming in on a, on a stock or selling was coming in on a stock. And that was really important for a a professional broker because you could buy and sell stock and then there'd be an uptick or a down clip. You could buy it, buy shares, and then sell them 20 minutes later and make, you know, $1,000, you know, stuff like that. So it was pretty exciting. But but like you say, Mm -hmm. it was a little boring too. And one night I went to a play and... I was very moved. I remember uh, crying, right? And I thought to myself, I remember going home and thinking to myself, you know, that seems that that seems like a much more interesting and exciting thing to do. And by that time, I'd uh, gotten to know my uncle a little bit, and uh, not and not that he wanted to help. He was not not going to help me at all. He didn't it, he didn't feel that was what you do. Uh, and he had actually, his advice was to get into a small theater company. And that's what this was. It wasn't a small theater company, but it was a professional theater company in Toronto. It was actually a very good one. It's called Toronto Workshop Productions. Mm-hmm. Anyway, I went back to the theater after the market closed the next day and there were, and, and there was a lady there. And I said to her, I said, uh, you know, 
I think I want to try to become an actor, and I don't know what to do. I don't know what my ne- what how to do that. And I'm wondering if there's some way you can help me. I said I'm willing to do anything because that's how I started in the stock market. I was willing to do anything. And uh, she said, uh, okay. She said, go to this address. She gave me a piece of paper. Go to this address and there'll be a guy there and he'll tell you what to do. But believe me, you're going to have to start at the bottom. And I said, great. So she said, but don't wear that $300, $400 suit. Mm. You know, you better come in jeans and et cetera. So I went back and I said to the I said to the guys, you take care of my accounts. I said, I'm giving up stock market brokerage. I'm going to become an actor. So I showed up at that place. And there was a guy there and he said, uh, he said, oh, you're the guy that wants to be an actor. I said, yeah. I said, you're the guy who's going to tell me what to do. He says, yeah, grab a shovel. And what we were going to do, him and I, is we were going to clean out a building that yeah. had been had sat empty for five years. We were going to make it into a brand new theater for this th- film company or theater company. They had just bought it, and uh, we had to clean out all the raccoons that had been living there and the various feral animals, and we had to clean it all out. So that's how I started. <laughs> anything, anything to get into show business, huh? Art Hindle is is, <laughs> yeah. is my guest. Did you have any idea yeah. that Porky's was going to be so huge? We'll get to face off no. in a second. We had no idea of anything. And I, people always ask me, I've done a, a few films that people consider classics. I've done a, a couple of horror films and sci-fi films and things like that. And that's one of the questions I get when I go to some of these signing shows or interviews and things they say, wow, you know, did you know it was going to be a classic? And you say, you don't even know if it's going to get into the theaters. You know, you don't even know. All you're doing is <laughs> yeah. you try to hurry up and make the movie before they take your money away. Yeah, okay, yeah, good point. <laughs> so if you go back to 1971, you, that was when you landed what you call your, your first big role in 71, which was The Proud Rider. <laughs> now, that was around the same time as Easy Rider was out. Coincidence? Yeah, that's why the, the 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 filmmakers were these people that lived in Oshawa uh, and Ajax and that, out there Pickering. Uh, they were mostly Hungarian, Czechoslovakian, mostly Eastern European people that were making these low budget, non union kind of war movies for the Eastern European market. Right. And then they decided when Easy Rider hit, they decided let's try and make a biker film. And they got in touch with the Satan's Choice. Oh, great. And made it some deals uh, that the, they would have the Satan's Choice in the film. And then they went, went around and started looking for an actor to play the lead role. And uh, I got the short straw. And you had no experience uh, on a motorcycle at that point, did you? Zero. Well, one, one, one time, my brother, who who loved motorcycles, um, <laughs> he he came. He brought his motorcycle down to a yacht club my dad belonged to, and I I was there. It was the Ashbridge's Bay Yacht Club, and he showed me his new motorcycle, and he said, "You want to try it?" And I said, "Okay," and I got on it with him on the back and and uh, started, you know, pu- turned the uh, throttle and froze and the bike took off and he had to stop it. He had to reach over and stop it. We got, it came to a stop. I jumped off the bike and said, I'm never going to ride a motorcycle bike uh, again. You're crazy to use that. I like only like things with four wheels. Forget it. So that was my only experience. And then, yeah. On, I auditioned on the Wednesday. They phoned me on the Thursday night and said, um, you start Monday. And I phoned my brother and I said, I need to learn to ride a motorcycle before Monday. <laughs> and uh, by that time, he was racing bikes. But he had just sent his bikes down to Quebec where he was going to race. He had no bikes. And then uh, he said, I'll look around. 
Friday afternoon, he finally got one. It was a Triumph Bonneville. And he uh, he took me down to underneath the Bloor Viaduct by the Don River, where there was a little sandy patch where we could ride around. And if I fell over, I wouldn't hurt myself. Rode around like that for about a half hour. And then he jumped on the back and he said, okay, let's let's go back to my place. So I drove him back to my place in his place in rush hour with him on the back of the damn thing. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Sunday, I went out to Oshawa to prep for this film. And I went to the Satan's Choice Clubhouse where the Jack the Bear, the gang leader, <laughs> Jack the Bear gave me a Decker to ride around for a couple of hours. And Decker is that big fat hog with the saddlebag kind of look. Uh huh. And then Monday morning, 7 a.m., the gang showed up at the studio in Lower East Oshawa. And uh, without the bike I they had for me, because they got raided. So the he said to the the gang leader said to the producers pick one of our bikes and so they picked the bike and it was a it was a chopper that's the one with the extended forks like Peter Fonda's yep and uh, so for the third time in four days I rode another different kind of bike <laughs> I tried it I went around the block and thought I can fake this and uh, the rest is history yeah. And what was it like working with the Satan's Choice? I mean, did, did they <laughs> welcome you? Were you intimidated? I mean, it would scare the hell out of me. Not, not the first day. The first day. So the guy whose bike they took away from him um, and gave to this, this guy, this punk, uh, had to sit on the back of somebody else's bike and watch me, we went out to a park that's east of Oshawa where we could take off our helmets and ride around and do riding scenes. And uh, because in the in the story, I was what's called a striker and I was joining the club. So the striker always rides at the back of the, of the convoy. Uh, he watched me grind the gears, drive over curbs, <laughs> drop the bike when I was trying to kickstart it, all kinds of things. And then at the end of the day, they said, rap. And he says, what's that? And they said, oh, that's, we're finished. And he got on the bike and he says to me, get on the back. I'm going to show you how to ride this thing. And we took off. The first curve we went into, I said to myself, I've been on this curve. I think we're going too fast. And we were. We went over, slid across the curve, and it was a high bank. And we flew in the air into a field, the three of us, him, me, and the bike. He ended up breaking his shin. I was okay, but I had, you know, my tire, my trousers, my jeans were torn a bit. And, uh, but I was able to stand up right away and walk, the gang showed up and, and the Jack, the bear started yelling at this guy, Monk, what the hell you try to do? You're trying to kill our lead actor and you're trying to ruin this business deal we got, you know. And uh, I walked back and I was really pissed. And I said, OK, who the fuck is going to drive me now? You know, <laughs> yeah. take me back now. Jack says, get on the back of my bike. And uh, I had no trouble with him after that. Wow. What, what a story. In fact, Ted, I had more trouble with Actra than I did with the Satan's Choice because um, <laughs> while we were shooting out at that park, I remember the first couple of days, I remember we were having, say, brought some kind of box lunch, and I see this guy in a suit. He comes out, and he's talking to the producer and the director and talks to a couple of the bikers, and then he leaves, right? And I, I think, oh, he's one of the producers. Well, it turns out, after I wrapped... And I went away for a week to chill, came back. There was, I had two letters from Actra. The first one was a letter saying you had, you did a non-union film and you have to come in for a hearing. And this, and then I opened the second letter and it said, you missed the hearing and now you're suspended for three months. And what it turned out to be was that guy in the suit was a guy from Actra. He talked to the producers, he talked to the director, he talked to some of the bikers, but you know who he didn't talk to? Me. 
Yeah. And I didn't know at the time that ACTRA covered films because at that time the acronym stood for the Association of Canadian Television and Radio Artists. Nothing right. about film. So anyway, I was suspended for three months. I had more trouble with them than the bikers. And, and, and ironically, years later, you end up working for ACTRA. <laughs> yes, yes. Warning people not to get suspended by ACTRA. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, uh, let's talk about the, the film Face Off, which, which is a Canadian classic. <laughs> it, it is a Canadian classic. Um, the, how much experience did you have on the ice? Could you skate? Did you play hockey as a kid? Were you, were you ready for this role? <laughs> Ted? Yeah? I was the only Canadian kid growing up in the beaches that did not skate. Oh, jeez. <laughs> okay. I did not. I did not skate. Um, my dad took me to the rinks when I was a little guy. He'd put the skates on me, but my feet would perspire, and then they'd freeze. They'd become chunks of ice from be, from being wet. So I just didn't like it. And then he'd have to take me home. So I never learned to skate. Um, when when I went social skating, people would say, "Oh, come on, we're going to go skating." I, I'd say, well, I have to get my ankle sharpened because that's what I would skate on. <laughs> so when I got that film, and that's a long story about getting the film, Johnny Bassett, who produced it, mm -hmm. wanted to see me skate, but he so he arranged a rink where I could go, and uh, but he showed up late. And so he, he said, let me see you skate around the rink. So I went once around, and I, I was a good enough athlete that I could go once around, look pretty good. And I had gotten down, I got pretty good at the stopping part where I could spray up some spray. I came to a stop. He says, that's great. I'll, I got to go. And he, he took off. He'd asked me to skate backwards or anything else. I probably wouldn't be talking to you right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and, you, and you play, uh, in, for the people, people who haven't seen the film, you play a Toronto Maple Leaf. Uh, was was Jim McKenney was he on ice in your in your in your role? Did he play you as it were during during the film? If I got that right. Uh, well, what they did, Ted, actually, what they did was they filmed Jim in actual hockey games. Right. And they were going to do all the hockey stuff at the end of the film. So all the acting stuff we did for a couple of months. And then at the end of the film, they were going to do all the, the skating stuff at Maple Leaf Gardens to match Jim. So I was able to, in those two months, learn to skate pretty well, well enough that Paul Henderson, who was on the Leaf team at that time, and actually I went on a road trip with him, he saw me skating because the Leaf coach was letting me practice my skating while we were on this road trip Uh in the at the beginning of the film and i was really horrible uh when he saw me two months later on the garden's ice i remember skating off and and stepping through the door through the boards and he grabbed me and he whispered in my ear he says how did you do that <laughs> so that's how that's how well i had improved my skating in that time so so I was pretty proud of, of how I was able to do that. So, uh, and that was back to back with learning to drive, ride a motorcycle. So yeah. I thought I thought I was doing pretty well. You know, I, I, any challenges? You know, if a producer asked me, "Oh, can you can you uh, do nuclear fission?" Yeah. I'd say, "Oh, yeah, yeah of course." You, you were you were probably hoping somebody was going to offer you a porn role. <laughs> Something where you have a little bit of experience. Oh, hi, my wife's here. I yeah, just... <laughs> okay, good. What what you've seen in in your fifty some odd years now working in this industry, in terms of the, the Canadian industry itself, we've produced some of the greatest talents uh, known to mankind, as as it were, um, actors, um, female and male actors. Sure. And and, and and their their work has been seen all around the world. But for some reason, we can't seem to get our own to connect with us here in Canada the way we do with other nations and the way other nations do with our talent. Why is that? Well, well because we, there's not enough population here to 
there, the, the, what you're talking about, I think what you're talking about is, is something that uh, some of my friends at Actor talk about trying to create a star system in Canada, yep. right? Yeah, that basically, I, 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 supp I yeah. suppose that's well, what it is. You can't, yeah, you can't create a star system on on our Canadian screens and television because there's not enough viewers to make a difference. Um, we do have a star system uh, of Canadians, and uh, unfortunately or fortunately, they're making a lot of money somewhere else. They're 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 big stars in in Los Angeles or New York, and uh, you know on the Broadway yeah. or or in Hollywood. Um, uh, you know Len Cariou or or uh, you know name any one of a dozen Hollywood actors who are big stars and uh, you know big money makers, uh, Ryan Reynolds or or uh, yeah. you know whomever you know. Uh, well, but what we're seeing now with this, with the proliferation of uh, of streaming services is is a lot of Canadian programs that are now being picked up in the states, and whereas um, we tend to look at them as just being there's just sort of our our guys, our neighbors who are, who are on television are now being looked upon in the states as being big stars because they don't look at us as being just because we're from Canada as we, we can't be big stars. It's 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 tough, you know the. Uh, how many times have you have you uh, have you watched the Canadian Film Awards or Television Awards, whatever the hell they call them now? They used to be called the Gemini's, the and Canadian Screen the Actor Genies Awards. And how many times have you watched something that's been has half a dozen nominations for a director, writing, acting, best show, and it's been canceled already? Yeah, right. The CBC has canceled it because there weren't enough people watching it, or CTV has canceled it because there weren't enough people watching it. I remember when I did ENG. Do you remember ENG, Ted? Of course I do. Of course I do. That you you won a Gemini for that. Yeah, it, it won it won five best series awards in a row, and uh, I remember talking to uh, the guy, the executive producer of it, and I said, why why isn't uh, CTV promoting our our show more, you know why aren't we getting, you know some, you know perks from CTV? He says because they don't you're 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 not the big deal on CTV. He says you're you're just Canadian content, something they have to do. Their big show is Cheers, or their big show is you know whatever the big American show is that they're showing on their their network. So we're just we're kind of an afterthought, even though we're winning all these awards and and being this best show. But yeah, it, it doesn't matter, you know, whether it's ENG or Do South or, you know, it's just we're just Canadian fodder, you know. And do you, do you see it getting any better? I mean, how would you keeping all these facts in mind, and, and how how do you go about encouraging young people to enter this industry? Well, you know, you have to you have to enter this industry with the idea that you want to be a creative artist. That's what I think. You can't enter you right. can't enter the industry and decide I'm going to live in Canada and I'm going to be in this industry and I'm going to make a lot of money because because you're not. Um, you, you're going to get a lot of satisfaction. You're going to you're going to do some interesting things. Uh, you know, there's a, certainly a lot of interesting uh, television and filmmakers in in Canada who will make interesting things. I know I've I have this one particular young director that I'm working with. Uh, I've done one I've done a couple of films for him. He's fabulous. He's just absolutely fabulous. He's 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 I don't know. He's like an uh, a Canadian Orson Welles. He's 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 going to be a big name someday, but but you know these are small films. He he can't get a, a big budget. You're not going to get paid much, you're, but you're going to have a lot of satisfaction. So you have to you have to just decide that's that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to be a living, uh, working actor. Mm -hmm. I'm going to I'm going to make some money. You know, more of the Ted Walsh podcast after this. 
Have you been tasked with the role of a state executor or expected maybe in the future you will be? Well, if so, let me make your life a lot simpler by introducing you to my friend Debbie Stanley. Debbie is the founder of ETP Canada. They specialize in estate administration. Their goal simply is to help Canadian executors understand their role and how to deal with a loved one's estate. Let's face it, there's no school for this. But ETP Canada offers services such as executor support, estate accounting, and they have a new online course called Executor Ready. It's an engaging video designed to make estate administration easier and affordable. And those are two comforting thoughts during a stressful time. So call Debbie Stanley at one 866 Three zero nine zero three eight seven. That's one eight six six three zero nine zero three eight seven. Or you can get her at info at etpcanada.ca. That's info at etpcanada.ca. Our Boxing Day sale is here, and it suits us perfectly. Hey, it's Ted Wallison for Tom's Place, and we love offering incredible deals during December and into Boxing Week. We're open for business, and more importantly, on sale each and every day except Christmas Day and New Year's Day. Check out our website, toms-place.com, for details about our specials and ours. We have no supply chain issues. We are fully stocked. In fact, we have huge amounts of inventory that we want to move, and the deals are simply amazing. Prices lower than ever in the 60-plus history of Tom's Place. Shirts, sweaters, coats, sports jackets, suits, and more price to be given away to you. And we've got gift certificates as well. Tom's Place Boxing Week sales on now, Kensington Market. So now, more than ever, you know it's important to shop local. Thank you for your support. Tom's Place, the Boxing Week sale, will suit you. Now back to Ted Wallachan. Art Hindle is my guest. You spent some time uh, in the early part of your career down in in the States. And boy, I, I look at the, the list of films and television programs that, that you appeared on over the uh, the course of the years. Uh, programs like L.A. Law, Matlock, Murder, She Wrote. Um, you were in a half dozen episodes of Dallas, for example, which was at, at, yeah, at its prime was one of the hottest television shows around. What was that like? You must have felt like you were on top of the mountain. Oh, yeah. Well, they're, they're, you know, if you look at my IMDb, you'll see that from 1968 to 1974, I did, I think, maybe six, six items. And then I had four kids at the time. Wow. So I couldn't make a living here. I had to do a little bit of theater, a little bit of this, a little bit of that, commercials, uh, industrial films. I remember doing an industrial film for Uniroyal Tires. Uh, I even did a little modeling, to, to, you know, to, to make a living. I went down to L.A. I finally decided I had resisted it for a while and finally decided to take the leap. And in I didn't work the first year I was there, but in the next two or three years, I did I probably double what I'd done the last six years in, in Canada. And uh, right. I ended up staying there 30 years. And uh, I had a great career down there and, and uh, worked pretty much all the time. You you started in, in I think, one, one of the scariest films that I've seen in a long time, The Invasion of the Body Snatchers. And what a group, what, a, what, a, what an ensemble. Oh, uh, Jeff Goldblum, Donald Sutherland, and I'd forgotten yeah. that Leonard Nimoy was in that film too. <laughs> yes, Leonard. Leonard was great, um, and Jeff Goldblum was great. Uh, Brooke Adams was the female lead. She was she was fabulous, uh, and and the director, one of the best directors I've ever worked with, uh, uh, Phil Kaufman, who did uh, the right stuff. If you remember that movie, and uh, yep. the incredible lightness of being. But Nimoy was Nimoy was great. You know, I, I for some reason Sutherland and I didn't hit it off, but that's okay. Um, I hit it off with everybody else, and uh, I had a great time on that film. And and uh, some people think it was it's the best remake ever done. Some people think it's uh, it stands on its own as a as a great film. So I'm very proud of that. If, if if I died and went to hell and they said, okay, we're going to punish you by making you watch one film you've done over and over again, 
And, but you can pick which one it would be, and I would pick that one. <laughs> yeah. What was it like working with? Uh, you worked, as I mentioned, you did an appearance on on Matlock. What was Andy Griffith like to work with? He's he's pretty much like you see him on on the on the on the show. He was you know laid back. He had kind of a southern thing about him about him, kind of a laid back kind of uh, gregarious guy guy, and he was uh, he was terrific. He did he did have a lot of lines to work, and he he used to. Sometimes if you're watching it, you can kind of see he had little yellow post-it note in his, in his palm of his hand that he would periodically look at. And he had his lines in there. <laughs> uh, the other guy I worked with that, that uh, was, uh, was uh, Raymond Burr. Mm -hmm. I did a series with Raymond Burr. My first series down there was with Raymond Burr. And, uh, and he, uh, he, um, <laughs> he, he used a, uh, a, a, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a thing that scanned the lines so he could read them, you know. The nicest person I ever worked with in, uh, down there was, uh, had to be uh, Angela Lansbury. The Murder She Wrote. She was great. And I did a couple of those shows. And we, we worked together a lot in the shows. You did, uh, you played the, the role of John F. Kennedy in, in a made-for-TV movie called uh, J. Edgar Hoover. And in that in that film, Rip Torn played right. LBJ. And Rip Torn did probably the best Nixon that I've ever seen in the film Nixon and Frost. But back to your role as JFK, I think there's been something like 23 yes. or 24 different actors who played uh, JFK over, over the years. Now, that's got to be intimidating in itself. The role, because of who it is that you're playing, is intimidating. And to know that you're going to be compared to like a half dozen or a dozen other people. Well, it's not even being compared to a half dozen other people. It's being compared to the man himself. Um, it's kind of like... Well, that's what I'm saying to begin with. And then on top of that... Yeah, no, uh, playing JFK is totally in intimidating. And... Uh, and it's a no-win situation. It's kind of like playing Jesus, you know. <laughs> you know, no one's going to believe it. No one's going to buy it. Uh, you know, you might as well just, you know, you just go and you just, uh, you're just kind of fodder. You yeah. know, you're just somebody that Treat Williams, who was playing Hoover, gets to talk to in the fake Oval Office. You know, that's about it. And, yeah. No, I'm saying the difference between playing Jesus and and JFK is. Everybody knows what JFK sounded like. I mean, nobody really, you know, you can't really do an impersonation of Jesus because no one really yeah. actually heard, heard him talk, you know. The odds are he doesn't have a Bronx accent, but, <laughs> you know, you can, it's like if you do JFK, people have said, it was, is, is, is he doing the, the David, uh, David, um, uh, uh, David, uh, what was the name of the impressionist? I can't remember. Is he doing the rich little uh, JFK or is he doing the, the David, uh, the other guy? JFK, which which impression is is he impersonating? Oh yeah, that that guy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Jackie, a uh, well, Ted. I I can't tell you exactly uh, what I was doing at that time, but uh, I remember Jackie saying to me, uh, "Is that Walshin? Is he uh, is he going to be interviewing you, or are you going to uh, are you going to be with Marilyn tonight? Why don't you invite him down to Dallas with us? <laughs> That's a That's like that line. You know that line well. Other than that, Mrs. Lincoln, how did you like the play? <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, you're working on, uh, on on a show called Surreal Estate now. T tell me about that. Oh, that Surreal Estate is great. It's a uh, it's a, it's a limited series. It's about a real estate company and guy who, if you have if you want to sell your house but you have ghosts in it. Uh, they come along and they get rid of the ghosts. Mm -hmm. uh, the the meet lead guy in it, a guy named Tim Rosen, who worked uh, worked on uh, he did as a matter of fact Shits Shits Creek and also he did uh, Winona Earp if you remember that series mm -hmm. with uh, Sarah Levy who by the way is also in it and I think she was in Winona Earp and also in Shits Creek as well. Uh, she, yeah, she's, she's, uh, she's our, uh, Eugene Levy's uh, daughter. Yeah. Yeah. Now, have you ever worked with Eugene? 
No, I've I've been in waiting rooms back when I was starting out in with uh, Eugene and Martin Short and Dan Aykroyd and uh, John Candy and all those people when when none of us uh, had gotten anywhere and we were trying to get the next beer commercial or the next car commercial mm-hmm. and we're all sitting in some waiting room waiting to go in an audition where there's no chairs and we're all sitting on the floor and we're making each other laugh like crazy that back in the day. How much directing have you done? And and do you, and do you, and are you planning on doing more? Uh I don't plan really plan on doing more unless it comes walking down the walking down the street and hits me in the face. Um I did I directed a lot of the ENG episodes. Mm-hmm. And I also did another series called Paradise Falls. Yep. And I directed that and then there was another series on the CBC where I directed a bunch of those and that's that's really about it. I, I, um, I do mentor a lot of directors, some young directors, and when I work with them, I, uh, I tend to give them advice and things like that, and uh, uh, you know, kind of get them out of trouble when they look like they're going to be painting themselves into a corner with, where they're going to turn around and find out that they're blocked by something or whatever it is. So, yeah, no, I. I'd like to do more directing, but it's very difficult. There's a lot of directors and uh, there's a lot of people standing in line before me, you know. If you could do just one or the other, which would it be, act or direct? Uh, well, here's, here's my attitude towards both of them. Uh, when I'm an actor, I feel kind of like I'm a kid at Disneyland. In fact, that's yeah. that's my quote. I always say a set is like a set a set is like my Disneyland. And when I'm directing, I feel like the adult in the room, and I have to be serious, and I have to, uh, you know, I have to uh, get the job done. I I kind of feel like it's it's kind of like you're in a foxhole, and you're trying trying to win some kind of battle. It's a battle to get get your day to get everything done in time because yeah. you know you're always fighting against the clock you know so that's the difference one one i'm a like a kid playing and the other i'm an adult that's a good point you, you also quoted as saying acting is the opposite of being driven insane it's being driven sane <laughs> what does that mean it means you know when you're on the set it everything everything is kind of uh, you know you have a script so you have you, everything's laid out you know what's going has happened in the past with the character what's happening now in this scene and what's going to happen and and unlike life where you don't know what the hell's going on half the time you know you're getting smacked upside the head with some kind of thing that you didn't see coming with with acting you kind of know what's happening and you can prepare for it and and you kind of can control it so it's it's kind of it's it's kind of a sane existence where real life in a lot of a lot of ways uh that you and I would be able to talk about is is kind of crazy you know you're always you know you like for instance you know there's nothing worse than getting a phone call in the middle of the night right you know, as a parent, you know, yeah. that's like, you say, you know, what's yeah. going on? Who is it? What's on the phone? What's happened? You know, that kind of thing. So you're always, yeah, yeah. you know, there's always a surprise around the corner. It's kind of insane that way. That's, that's kind of what I meant by that. Okay. That makes sense. That makes sense to me. And what's, what's on the horizon of, for Art Hindle in the foreseeable future? Is there anything you're working on right now other than uh, you're working currently with surreal estate? No, I'm I'm still I'm still working with with surreal estate. I just I just wrapped that one. That's there. We're in our second season. Um, I don't. My character is dead in the show. Wow. I play the lead character's father, who has passed away, and uh, we did a scene just the other day where I'm basically going to be moving on to the next step in the in the passed away process i'm i'm i don't know where i'm going i'm i'm going from limbo to something else you know and uh so i don't know what's happening with that 
I've got a film that's happening in the spring that's a really good feature film. Um, they're just putting the money together on that one now. Um, and that's that's pretty much it. I pretty, Because of COVID, Ted, I've been kind yeah. of turning a lot of things down. I've kind of... Uh, I'm kind of, I don't want to, the set is not as much fun. The set is not my Disneyland lately. It's because um, what we have to do to keep it going is we have to have a lot of safety protocols. And most of those mean wearing masks and shields all the time. Except when the actors act, then we take the shield off, the mask off, do the acting, and then right away, as soon as they say cut, there's somebody there with a little plastic box and you and you take your shield and mask out and put it back on and and like that. That's how in fact you're you're rehearsing the scenes in a mask and a shield. And that's no fun. I I I always say that yeah. and for actors out there who are listening, the best way the, the best thing to do about if you want to be a good actor is listen. And for me, part of listening when I'm working with an actor is looking at their face. So you're, you're yeah. listening with your ears and your eyes. And uh, when I'm rehearsing a scene with some, another actor and I can't, I can only see their eyebrows, you know, that's, that's not much fun. That's, that's, that's not for me, that's not much fun. So so I've been pr pretty much saying no. Now, the thing I'm doing in, in the spring, I committed a long time ago. And also, it's a wonderful film about a family uh, with a wonderful ending to it. And, uh, you know, so I'm and, you know, and there's just certain people that if they call me, I'm there for them. But, uh, you know, I'll do it no matter what. But uh most of the time, if it's somebody I don't know, things like that, you know, it has to be a really interesting project, but mostly I'm saying no these days. Yeah. Still playing a lot of golf? Uh, playing a, a little bit. I've been playing with uh, at, uh, St. Andrews Valley up here. Mm -hmm. uh, but actually what I've been doing more of is playing tennis, a lot more tennis. Well, good for you. Keeps you in shape, too. Keeps your, keeps your mind in shape. Yeah. You know, with, with uh, golf... Um, I'm not hitting it as far as I used to. No, well, yeah. Funny uh, that. And, uh, but you know, I mean, I'm still, I'm, you know, I'm still breaking 90 sometimes, you know, so that's, that's good enough, you know, and I, I've got a, a good bunch of guys here that I play with. Art's been a real pleasure t uh, chatting with you. I really appreciate you taking the time and, uh, and spending some, some of it with me this afternoon. And thanks once again to all for listening. And if you do get a chance, click on the follow button and the podcast will always be there for you. And also, if you get a chance, go online and fill out your organ and tissue donation card. You could change or even save a life. Have a great week. The Ted Wallace and Podcast has been brought to you by Helenda's The Meat People. Enjoy their award-winning products at Selected Metro, Sobeys, Fortino's, and Foodland locations. Helenda's The Way Sausage Should Taste. And Tom's Place, for the finest in men's clothing at unbeatable prices, it's Tom's Place at 190 Baldwin in the heart of Kensington Market. Tom's Place will suit you. The Ted Wallachian Podcast is produced by Joey Roselli. Technical production by Paul Gatt. Music by Bike Thieves. I'm Becky Coles. Submit your questions and comments to ted at twmedia.ca.